Today's show is brought to you by KetConnection.com. Check out the redesigned KetConnection.com and check out the brand new Brewers Club Rewards Program. That's right, earn points with every purchase and get discounts and deals on future orders. KetConnection also launched a brand new financing program so you don't have to wait to order the gear you want today. Go to KetConnection.com, use the promo code HHH, and you'll receive 5% off your order. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question that you'd like discussed on a future episode, visit homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the submit a question link at the top of the page. Or you can call them or text them in by using 325-305-6107 and leave your message after the beep. I am your host, Joshua Steubing, and today I'm joined by the Director of Operations at cmbecker.com, Mr. James Carlson, and the President and Chief Keg Washer at kegconnection.com, Todd Burns. I wanted to get a sound bite of that song we've used before when we're all away, and then we come back, the reunited. Yeah, uh, in our yeah, I wanted to, but uh, I didn't. Well, also, too, because I've learned my lessons with licensed music. We've been over that before. I, uh, I can't really dance to that song either. No. <laughs> oh, you... you, you you could have just stopped it. I can't really dance, and we would have believed you. <laughs> like that. You didn't have to say yeah, a whole lot. Yeah, you sound like my wife. <laughs> you didn't have to say a whole lot more than that. Welcome back to Friends and Family. Uh, emphasis on family, because that's who's listening to the show. Episode 107 of the Homebrew wow. Happy Hour. I'm, 107. That's J- amazing. You know what? And two, James, uh, I give a lot of credit to you, because whenever you came on board with CM Becker, uh, we, we had interviewed you prior to that. Right, as yeah, a home brewer a couple times. And, and yeah and you had a good time on it and you're like hey anytime you want me back on the show and then when you uh like i said when you took over at, at cm becker uh you were like you know what why don't you do the podcast anymore and i was like oh we've been busy i was just giving you and it, <laughs> you do not mince words either you were like no you need to do the show again I, I'll, yeah it's fun exactly it, it, uh, it everyone listening y'all need to send beer and free stuff to james he's the one <laughs> He, he answers all your questions. He is the reason no, we're still doing No, not just me. It's a, it's a group thing. You're you know? right. Google.com and James Carlson. <laughs> and, now, and Todd. Todd's actually been on a roll last week. Uh, Todd, we got great feedback on, on the episode last week. I got a lot yeah. of feedback. Uh, yeah, about the kettles. A lot of people writing in, um, complimenting uh, the the. I forget that I have to pull up my email and now I'm put now I'm just uh, buttering myself up for no good reason. Uh, one guy did mention I do remember this wasn't a compliment at all. He, how uh, we were talking about whether or not any of the major uh, premium kettle makers had a five gallon and SS does have a five and a half. I didn't look up Spike or anyone else, but just a tidbit of follow up information. A listener came in and said, I've been using my five and a half gallon kettle from SS for forever for all grain and it works out perfect for five gallon batches. So okay. th- there you go. A little piece of follow up for us. Uh, James, it is nice to have you back, sir. How, yeah. was Flo- how was Florida? It was fun. It was fun. I'm glad to be back in Texas. The weather was really nice. I bet. It was, uh, I know when I left for the airport Thursday, it was 93 degrees, but it wasn't real humid, which was odd. Of course, I was in central Florida, so I was quite a few miles from the, I think it was 30 miles from Tampa is where I was at. So I'm but not, it, I learned a lot. Uh, yeah. the, the, the best thing about that class is it taught me I don't know anything about draft dispensing, you know. <laughs> I'm a gabber did the whole time, <laughs> but it was fun to play with the uh, long draw with the Glock all set up. They have some really nice toys. It was fun. Todd. Yeah, that, that really it, is a fun class. Todd and I, you, I don't know if you listened last week. We didn't throw you under the bus, but I did mention to Todd uh, asking him if he thinks he'll do that class ever again. Like if it was something that would require refreshing and surprisingly enough, he said, yeah, it wouldn't be that bad of an idea for him to, to go back and retake it. The information from what I gather, since I haven't been, and this is not me trying to go, I promise, because that's not, it doesn't seem the most exciting. But uh, from what I gather, they throw a lot at you, right, James? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty intensive. It's it's nonstop. When we got there uh, Tuesday morning, we didn't get out of there till nearly 6 o'clock. So 
you know, it's a long day and they give you just a few minutes for lunch and a few breaks, but it's, it's, it's pretty intensive course. And Todd went through it. He knows, but I think you ought to go through it again. Well, so when did, when do you start in the morning? Uh, eight o'clock every morning is when we started six. Hey, that first day was six. Uh, uh, the next day was around five. And then uh, the Scott let me out early because I was concerned about getting there on time, the airport. I so he let me on, out a little bit early. I counted it on my fingers, and that's 10 hours, Josh. So I guess you're out, right? Yeah, well, I was, I was about to say, that sounds like a Todd Burns work day. Count me out. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what I want to sign up for. Yep. No, I like this. I like this Germany trip. I was told I was talking to some of our peers at CMB Schankenlagen, and, and uh, they are going to be like twelve-hour days. But it's not going to be a twelve-hour day in the sense that I'm going to complain. Uh, it's going to be, I think, a more enjoyable long day of of spending time with each other, which is a great segue to my next part of the small talk portion of our show. Friends, we leave. Uh, this is publishing. We're recording on November 1st, Thursday. This is published technically that night, but f- most people get it Friday morning, November the 2nd. Uh, n- one week and one day, my friends, we will be on a jet plane heading uh, across the pond, as they say. Well, that's the UK. Uh, we're going to Germany, landing in Frankfurt on Saturday or on Sunday? I think it's the same pond. Yeah, it's the same pond. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll be landing. Todd, you, no, no, no. We no. leave on Saturday, and then we, we land in Frankfurt on a Sunday. It is the same pond, but Todd, you, of all the, like, uh, sayings or colloquialisms or whatever, you give me crap because one time I called Germany the fatherland or the motherland. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's oh, Fatherland. No, you're yeah. right, but that's not even the motherland. same. Motherland, Russia's the motherland. And those are two different countries. I don't know what yeah. point I'm trying to make right now. Uh, I, I hear, Here's the point I'm trying to make. Going to Germany, landing in Frankfurt, going to be at the Brow uh, from November the, let's see here, November, it starts November the 13th, it ends November the 15th, but we're going to be there for a few days before setting up, we're going to be there for a few days after, and then we're going to Prague. Uh, people who are listening are probably like, yeah, you, you already talked about that and you've, you've mentioned it enough. No, I haven't mentioned it enough. I am so excited you, you don't even know. The only uh, little thing we got to work out is getting me there to DFW. But that's a minor detail, right, Todd? <laughs> Awkward silence when I'm asking you how I'm going to get to DFW. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> okay, so we just had a little bit of a glitch. That is, uh, I guess, the, uh, the things you might run into when you're doing remote interviews but anyways i was talking about getting to dfw and i thought there was an awkward silence when i said that's the only p- little bit of of uh, uh logistics we have to figure out and then and then it went dark i thought todd you bailed on me because you didn't want to tell me i wasn't going on the trip or something it got oh awkward. no you're definitely going yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to do that god you're a yeah. job uh, you know uh Golly, I'm done with small talk. Actually, I do want to say one more thing. My wife, who barely listens to this show ever, today we're recording this on her birthday, and the day this is published uh, is my birthday. I, don't don't get me anything, Todd. You don't have to get me anything. Okay. But uh, 33 years young for me, and 32 years young for her. It, wow. Uh, and, She's wow. a lot younger than you do. That's weird. Yeah, uh, you're telling me. And can you believe I've almost spent a third of my life with you? Ugh. Uh. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Well, <laughs> when you word it that, longer than your wife, right? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. Well, all my, my wife's barely been in my life longer than you have. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, I mean, we've been together longer than you and your wife have been married, right? You have, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. You hired me a few months after I got married. So, oh, I didn't yeah. realize that. I thought it was before. Okay. No. Anyway, we have a Q and A show, and barring any more technical difficulties, let's just jump into it before. All my system crashes and we don't have a show this week. Question number one comes from Jeremy using the homebrew happy hour.com. Submit a question link. He says, hi, guys. Love your show. Josh, you should be nice to Todd. If you poke the bear too much, you may get bit. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, that, and, and that's all he wrote. How weird. No, uh, I work about 30 minutes away from where I live and just enough time to listen to one full episode each way. It took me about three months, but I've listened to every one of your shows. That's got to be painful because the first. That's cool. Yeah. The, no, the first 40 episodes were cringy and I apologize, guys. Uh, <laughs> my question is, how can one prevent moisture in the kegerator so that mold doesn't form? And what's the best solution for cleaning the kegerator if mold does start to form? I have some ideas to try, but why recreate the wheel if someone else has a solution? Thanks, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. I pulled this one 
uh, the two questions yeah. today were were very last minute because I had an interview. It fell through. No big deal. I sent you an episode, and lo and behold, Todd was like, "That is actually really relevant oh, because yeah. I'm dealing with this right now." So, Todd, you take it. Excellent right. question. But I, I have a trivia question for you first, Josh. Sure. He, he said, uh, "Poking the bear." Is that normally is that referring to the motherland or the fatherland? Oh, easily the motherland, because Russia is the motherland. Yeah. Yeah, you're so good. <laughs> yeah, you're smart today. All right, so I had a massive mold outbreak in my kegerator a, a few weeks ago. And, and the reason primarily is, is that I unplugged it, and I didn't clean it very well before I unplugged it. And then I left. So there, there's there's a beer in there. Uh, I don't know what you, you know, uh, beer that had spilled in there. And I don't know if everybody on the show knows this, but mold loves beer. I mean, it just <laughs> thrives in beer. It's like mold fuel. So I open my and, and so normally, if you keep your kegerator open when you unplug it and you and you clean it out, hopefully. You don't have as much of a problem with mold, but if you shut the refrigerator and it's not cold, you just have this explosion. So I opened it up and the whole inside of my stainless steel kegerator is just black, right? So I had to, I had to clean everything, take everything out. I had to uh, mix up a bleach solution, water and bleach. And then I just had to wipe everything down. I, the hoses seemed okay. Uh, they were fine on the inside. They were they had mold on the outside, so I, I wiped them down really good on the outside, and cl- took all the disconnects apart, put them in bleach, put all the faucets in bleach, ran bleach and cleaning solution through the lines, and wiped everything down. And I was able to get rid of all the mold, which really wasn't his question. But that's kind of what you have to do if you do have a mold outbreak is you got to clean it really well. And one of the best things you can you can use is a bleach solution. Uh, mold may like beer, but it does not like bleach at all. So that that's the best way to clean it out. As far as not getting mold in the first place, uh, so I ran out of beer in my kegerator uh, a, a few uh, about a week or so ago, and I may have been I may have been underestimating how long ago this mold outbreak was. Maybe it was more like over a month ago, but <laughs> yeah, maybe about a week ago I ran out of beer again. So I left the refrigerator on mold does not do well in a cold environment. So the reason you don't get mold when it's in your kegerator normally is it's 32 degrees and it doesn't grow well in mold. If, if you, so but because I had a major mold outbreak, I'm more susceptible to it now because there's still some in there hiding. Uh, I think the, the most important thing you can do is when you take a keg out, make sure you clean any beer that may have spilled uh, you know, periodically clean and, and use a little bit of bleach. You you want to use a little bleach, bleach it, and then wipe it down because you don't want bleach to stay on the stainless steel because although stainless steel is not supposed to rust, bleach is extremely corrosive, so it will rust if you leave it on there. So that my suggestion would be to just always be cleaning that up and making sure that if you do get a little speck of mold that you keep it clean and keep the kegerator cold. If you do want to shut your kegerator down, and you want to leave it shut down for a while, it's important to clean it out, like I just spoke, like I just said, but also leave the door open. If you leave the door open and you have circulation, it, it will greatly re- reduce the amount of mold that uh, problems that you may have because it dries out, first of all. M- you know, mold needs moisture. And, uh, and second, it, you know, you've got the circulation. So I like that, what you just said about all, uh, always be cleaning. ABC. You were in yeah. sales, always be closing, but always be cleaning. And uh, I like that only because it is it is relevant for every aspect of home brewing. From, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, brew day and and uh, obviously when it's fermenting, you need clean environment. And uh, whenever it's in the keg itself and, and your lines, I've learned the hard way uh, because I'm lazy or I've been more lazy than before. Now that my dad and all the equipment's at his house, I've learned that I'm, I get embarrassed when I'm lazy around other people that aren't you, Todd. And so I will uh, be, we cl- like we cleaned his lines out the other day and I say we, he cleaned his lines out the other day. So maybe I'm still lazy, right. but uh, cleanliness is your best friend in regards to your beer and having the best beer. Well, um, 
we've beat this horse before, but who was it that originally told us like I'm a I'm a janitor that gets to brew sometimes? Do you remember that? Who told us? Oh that? yeah, yeah, I, I forgot. But that's well, exactly. most brewers would say that. Yeah, you know, and and, and it was true. someone who was taking the quote from someone else. But I remember early on someone telling us that. I don't remember if it was Eric Odershock or one of the brewers that we had, one of the pro brewers that we had interviewed. But yeah, I'm a janitor that sometimes gets to brew. If you want good beer, you're going to be a janitor. But yeah, back to like Jeremy's point. Preventing it is, uh, I don't know if the word easy is right. Uh, James, would you say preventing mold is easy or just you have to be tedious to prevent it? I don't think you have to be too tedious. You just have, like Todd said, you have to be aware of how how it happens, what are the causes, and how to prevent it. It's real simple if you know I, that. I would suspect if we walked into our kegerator and walked over and looked in our kegerator right now in our office, there, we probably could find some mold somewhere. Oh, absolutely. It, it, yep. It's all about not letting it uh, propagate, you know. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And simple bleach, who doesn't have bleach laying around? So right. it's not like you have to go get some exotic cleaner. Of uh, all the things. Little, that little bleach you, goes a long way. Exactly. And of all the things you can propagate from brew day, don't let mold be one of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for submitting the question. Question number two today comes from Jose, who used the submitted question format, homebrewhappyhour.com. He wrote in, hey, guys, so I was thinking of making a marshmallow milk stout for Christmas and looking around for info. A lot of people have recommended putting the marshmallows during the boil or during primary fermentation, and I have no clue what to do, and I don't want to screw up because I want to impress my family this Christmas. Any help would be great. Cheers. Uh, let me let me add my two cents in real quick. Sure. When you're trying to impress your family and they don't like your beer, that's when you pretend you're a snob and they, they, you just don't get it. It's just my right, beer. My right. beer is too complex for you. That's why you don't get it. I've mastered. <laughs> I've mastered that with my family. But anyway, Todd, we talked about this off air. You and James both, yeah. uh, I liked your idea. So if you don't mind taking the lead on this, because sure. I've never brewed with, well, specifically, I've never brewed with marshmallow. Uh, I have not either. So we should probably preface it with that. But, you know, marshmallow, the flavor of marshmallow is primarily sugar and vanilla. So, I, and, I, and I actually thought of another idea since we spoke. So I, I hope uh, James will agree with me on this, but I think that the marshmallow itself, it, it, because it's basically corn syrup uh, or most of them are, some may be sugar, but primarily corn syrup and vanilla is the major flavoring. All the corn syrup is going to do is ferment. And you you could just throw corn syrup in and ferment it and you get the same thing. I think you, what you would need to do to get that creamy marshmallow feel in that beer is to add some vanilla extract and then also maybe some lactose because lactose is not very fermentable. It gives you a creamy mouthfeel. And, and I, I think that lactose and vanilla would give you that marshmallow taste. What, what do you think, James? Yeah, I would definitely use unfermentable sugars. Another thing you can do uh, that I've done in the past, if you want to cream your mouthfeel is just mash at the higher temperature. So you create those long sugar uh, chains that aren't as easily dispersed by yeast. So it creates body, mouthfeel, and then add some vanilla bean in the uh, secondary or the primary. Uh, Another yes. option, too, is you, uh, Amazon actually sells marshmallow concentrate that you can buy. <laughs> it's like five bucks for a, a just a little bottle. Is and, it uh, an essential oil I can burn as well? Uh, just just uh, asking for a friend. I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. At, at five bucks, you could probably uh, you could probably try it. I'm see. sorry, that was a bad attempt at a joke. Just I live in I live in middle class suburbia where everyone's peddling like uh, essential oils onto each other. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, and so they're like I, I'm I if there's not a business for that yet, I'm gonna start marshmallow extract. Oh, do you, you honey? Should. You need to calm down here. Burn burn one ounce of this marsh todd your wife loves uh essential oil she could be my first customer i can i can sell her the marshmallow edge yeah job. absolutely now you may not like my lactose idea josh right why wouldn't i like your lactose idea uh, don't you have a lactose intolerance oh i power through baby i had a bowl of okay. i had a big okay. bowl of uh frosted flakes this morning for breakfast yeah i, I power through i am you don't hear it because i have a good filter here i am just farting away <laughs> Right. <laughs> this green, this this screen behind me wasn't green when we started, Ben. It was. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, I think what we need to do on something like that because it sounds like an interesting idea. 
I think that he definitely needs to send us a sample of that when he's done. Definitely, yeah. Tell us how, yeah. how he did it and then send us a sample. I agree, and I have all their contact information of the people who submit questions. I will just happen to follow up on this one. There you uh, go. There I, you, go. I, you know, this, from, this is not really about his – or this isn't from his question, but it's kind of on topic. Uh, I had a brew day this last weekend, guys, and my aunt and uncle came up to to learn from the master, obviously. And they were asking me, my aunt is making a cider and she's talking about bat sweetening. And I had no idea what to do because uh, uh, she's worried with her cider that if she adds sugars for sweeten, it's going to reinvigorate uh, the, the fermentation. It's going to affect the profile and all that. Non-fermentables, James, could you describe uh, the different, like, what are fermentable, non-fermentable in their uses. A lot of people, as we all know, listening to the show are new and non-fermentable is a very straightforward term, but it, would you only be using non-fermentable for flavoring? Does it affect the body? Does it affect? The, oh yeah. The Typically they go hand in hand. So yeah. if, you, if you're going to add non-fermentables, you're wanting more mouthfeel, more body and more sweetness to the beer. Typically that would be in a stout. We see that a lot in stouts, but you can also do it. Uh, we, uh, Wes, a friend of ours, and I were trying to recreate a uh, red beer, by, a popular red beer, and it has a little more mouthfeel and body than normal. So we uh, we we had a hand at that. We're, we probably ended up with too much mouthfeel and too much sugar. So you can manipulate that. All grain brewers can manipulate that. Uh, extract brewers can as well. They just have to use lactose. Right. Well, and and <laughs> lactose is unique because it, it's actually milk sugar mm -hmm. and it doesn't ferment. So it gives you, it, it really kind of gives you that creamy milk, not just mouthfeel, but that creamy milk taste. Sure. Uh, yeah. So it, it is a really good sugar if you're trying to create that spice specific taste i think we so. did a, absolutely we just kegged the melt stout james your recipe mm -hmm. and, and whoo buddy talking about how the lactose uh, i almost regret not having a nitro set up it was it was smooth like my dad who's uh, not the biggest fan of the style but i'm trying to i'm trying to have us brew at least some kind of different style regularly mm -hmm. so just so we have the the feeling of brewing the right the different styles and tasting sure. them he really liked your recipe man he loved I it i love that style of beer i've always liked it you know i think it started with what is the one that's real famous the milk stout uh, the uh left hand, uh, left hand. Yeah, yeah the nitro uh, milk milk that's stout that, that's actually the first one i ever tried me too uh, and great. it was actually i think it was your suggestion you were josh's suggestion and it was phenomenal Phenomenally good. Did you have yeah. it? On, it was nitro or was it was CO two? I've had it both, and I think Todd bought them both back when we were uh, commuting back and forth from Desoto and back. He was very, very good at keeping good beer in the fridge, so that was always <laughs> one that uh, if he Much saw better. it, he would get it. I and, uh, and that reminds me to ask you guys because I am uh, going to get a nitro set up for the cold brew coffee. My wife is really interested in doing that. Is there anything like with the melt stout that I'd have to do different during the brew day, or is the nitro just part of the dispensing part? Just, I would say, wouldn't you agree, Todd? That would be part of the dispensing. It is. You, you um, but when you not, you actually want to infuse some of the nitrogen in with CO two with the beer gas, so you're not carbonating it but you know infusing it with the nitrogen as well so it's a little different but that's probably probably a whole episode yeah yeah that that's what definitely. i was gonna say we actually have a bunch of questions coming up or a future episode because we've had a lot submitted talking about bigger beers what's suitable for nitro blah 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 i won't go too down too far down that trail but um i did want to just cover that at the, at the top because i the first thing i said when i tasted it uh we we force carved it on saturday and then we uh tried it on a tuesday afterwards this previous tuesday and uh, the first thing i said was that is almost perfect i think if it came off nitrogen it would be legitimately perfect it, it was it, it's a phenomenal brew and i think the one thing uh i'm digressing a little the one thing i'm gonna probably miss when we go to all grain brewing is the safety that i have in your extract recipes <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> you know uh, what i, I, you know what I mean you know what i, I mean Totally. You know, you don't have to worry about gravity or any of that, but I would just encourage you to, to make that leap because I think you're going to find that's, it's, it's, uh, Todd did it. No problem. I mean, he's a phenomenal all grain brewer and uh, it didn't take a lot of, 
uh, just kind of nudging him in the right direction. And he's, he's very good at it. And I think you can be too. That's why I like having you on the show. <laughs> Todd. Lab- I, know, I, I do too. I'm not going to make any comment at all of that because <laughs> he said I'm phenomenal. <laughs> well, he did. A, he's done a, every beer he's ever brewed has been really good. So that's testament to his, his attention to detail. And, and he's very, he's a very sanitary brewer. So he's always, he's always, uh, aware of the fact that everything needs to be clean. He's methodical. He takes notes. He's, he's somebody that would be a good teacher on all grain. No, sure. it's, it's the only part of my life where I'm really clean. I think. <laughs> yeah. We can smell you from here. No kidding. Uh, before we wrap it up, I do want to ask, uh, because we're about to leave and I know you have that check dark logger on mm-hmm. uh, being cold conditioned right now. I think it's long. It is. Do yeah. you have plans for, any brew days between now and our trip, or do we have plenty of beer? I've got to do, I'm going to do one tomorrow just to test out a new product. Um, we're kind of at the final stages. I've already tested it once. Um, we did a uh, chocolate um, oatmeal coconut stout. Sitting right over there in my office. I had nothing to do with brewing it, but somehow a uh, fermenter ended up in my office. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think both of them are there, aren't they? Uh, Joe's and then the one that we did, which is in a white bucket. Oh, maybe so. I, I bet that's that Joe's. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we're, we tasted a little bit. Gravity spot on. Uh, the coconut really woke it up. So I can't wait for you guys to try it. I can't wait to try it. Yeah. When I come I up, either. Todd, you didn't have any beer for me when I come up on Monday. Well, so opening weekend of deer season is this weekend. All my buddies are coming and they've all been emailing and saying, we're so looking forward to having James's Kolsch. Uh, <laughs> and and oh, I'm no. like, uh, we, uh, we don't have any beer. Uh, so anyway, uh, so the answer is we no. Do have some ball. beer. We're going to find some and put some together. Oh, I guess who just walked in. Somebody we talk about a lot on the podcast. My father just walked in my office. Nice. Oh, that, cool. Yeah, you have to come say hi real quick. Yeah, definitely. Have we, I don't on. know if you know it, but we make fun of you as an engineer and other things during the. <laughs> <laughs> say hi. Hi. Hey, uh, there's. Hey, Paris. Mr. Burns. <laughs> that. that we, yeah. So we're we're about to go eat lunch. So. Well, I'll let you go. We'll wrap it up there. That is a future episode with your dad. Uh, you know, we'd have to maybe have to be a different podcast. Maybe we could do a brew day with your dad. That I, would be fun. I yeah, think that'd be enjoyable. Guys, Definitely. thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, everyone. And that Great. will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, visit homebrewhappyhour.com. Click on the submit a question link at the top of the page or call or text them in by dialing 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsor, kekinetchen.com, for supporting our podcast and the homebrewing community. Go to kekinetchen.com, use the promo code HHH, and you'll receive 5% off your order. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening. 